Hello, Bond fans, and welcome once again. Uh, so, you know, looking back, EA Games had an awful lot of stick at the time for their James Bond video game output, but as far as I'm concerned, I think they did a pretty amazing job. They were always compared unfavorably to Rare and the N64 GoldenEye, but in my rather controversial mind, they made a selection of games which did actually better the N64 GoldenEye. There's no doubt that the company peaked with the release of Everything or Nothing, a great game with great reviews and great sales, followed by a pretty, pretty cash-in in the form of GoldenEye Rogue Agent. It was an interesting time. Where would EA go from here? Well, back to the success of Everything or Nothing, of course, but they had no Bond. Brosnan stepped down, forward slash was let go from the role, and with no new Bond announced, it seemed EA were in a bit of a pickle. How to make a Bond game without a Bond? Well, they went back in time and got an old Bond, and probably the one you would least expect to agree to do this sort of thing. Announcing From Russia With Love as the next James Bond game really was quite a curveball at the time. I mean, even now, still looking at the list of Bond games, you kind of look at it and say, Really? Really? That one? They did that one as a video game? But you know what? Sometimes something wonderful and unique can come out of strange and bizarre decisions. So let's have a look at this game then, shall we? Let's dive right into you from Russia with love. The game. The game opens with the live-action Bob Simmons gun barrel sequence from the film. Uh, for a start, this annoys me. Would it really have been so hard to have a CG Connery do this? Going from live-action to video game graphics is kind of jarring. Anyway, on with the game. Uh, in the first of many changes from the 1963 film, the game opens at the Houses of Parliament. We see some shady-looking characters infiltrating a swanky-looking party, and a man exit an Aston Martin DB5 while wearing what must be the baggiest trousers to have existed in the 1960s. I mean, look at how that material flows. But this being an Aston Martin, it could only only belong to one man, even though he didn't receive such a car until the next film in the series. May I help you? A dry martini. Shaken, not stout. So yeah, that's Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Like, living, breathing Sean Connery was a put in a booth with a microphone and a script and recorded brand new dialogue for this game. Like, not, not the sound alike, not, not his son, or, y you know, not even reused archive audio from the film. Actual, living, breathing Sean Connery recorded dialogue, new d dialogue as James Bond. What? Like, oh, I can't begin to, like, express how confusing this was at the time. I mean, this is Sean Connery, this is Sean, I will never play a James Bond again for as long as I live, I won't even talk about it in interviews. Sean Connery, like, how did, I, I mean, I know this is a long shot, but if anyone who actually worked on this game is watching this video, please get in touch because I would, I would love to know how on earth you managed to get Sean Connery to record new dialogue as James Bond for this video game. Like, I, I, I mean, did someone have compromising photos of him? Did someone have a nuclear bomb over Scotland and threaten to detonate it if he didn't do it? Like, I, I honestly can't think of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, how much money did you pay him? God, I mean, well done, whoever you are, whoever sprang this, but, you know, bloody good job. Well done. I'll talk more about Connery as the game goes on, but suffice to say, it is initially quite shocking... Positively shocking. ...to know that he actually came back to do this. So, Bond is at Parliament to look after the Prime Minister's daughter, played by... Natasha Bedingfield. Okay, I take back everything negative I said about Maya in Everything or Nothing. Oh! What do you know? Look, she's being kidnapped. Too bad. The game is over, Mr. Bond. I think it's just begun. So the level begins proper, with bits of tutorial, and instantly you can tell the game uses the same mechanics as everything or nothing. The lock-on shooting, the vaulting, the cover system, the weapon selection interface, etc. I'm not complaining about this, the mechanics worked fine for the other game, and if something isn't broken, then no need to fix it. 
This is a very exciting game opener, with Bond running around the Parliament building, blasting his way through baddies, Bond theme trumpeting away. I can't think of a better way to begin a Bond game. Oh! My daddy's a very powerful man, you know, you can't just go around Shut doing up! Fortunately, Natasha Benningfield's presence doesn't sully the opening of this game too much, but I mean, did anyone even tell her she was meant to be playing a Prime Minister's daughter? I mean, I didn't do any research into this, but I'm pretty sure that senior politician daughters from the 1960s did not talk like they were auditioning for Tart Number 3 in Oliver the Musical. My daddy's a very powerful man, you know, you can't just go around Shut doing up. this- Shut up! Oh, my daddy's a very powerful man, you know, you can't just go around doing this, Bill Sykes! Any ill feeling from this unfortunate casting is nullified, though, once you make it to the rooftop, don a jetpack, and face off against a helicopter. Oh lord, this is the 1960s Bond video game done right. I don't even care that Bond doesn't get his jetpack until two films more. This game may be called From Russia With Love, but it takes elements from all of Connery's first films, and I'm fine with that. The name is Bond. James Bond. Next up is a credit sequence, using an instrumental version of the classic From Russia With Love theme. It's a cool sequence, and it's nice to see the likenesses of most of the now-dead original cast appearing, as well as some new faces like Maria Menounounou... Uh, 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 oh, I earn Beddingfield again. The next level begins following the From Russia With Love story. You play a man with a Connery mask running around a, a maze trying to catch an unseen assailant. There's a quick cameo from what I think is Aki's car from You Live Twice here before the man in the Bond mask is killed and we are introduced to Red Grant, his Garrow watch, and Rosa Klebb. Record time, Mr. Grant. You are indeed the killer I'm looking for. When do I get to kill the real James Bond? After he steals from the Russians their new Lector decoding machine. And Bond is going to do it for us? We assume that's who MI6 will set. There is a girl in the Russian consulate in Istanbul, Tatiana Romanova, who I've ordered to help. She believes I am still with KGB. Won't MI6 suspect it's a trap? My reading of the British mentality is that they always see a trap as a challenge. And then you can avenge the death of our Dr. No. Let Bond's death be a particularly unpleasant and humiliating. One of my main criticisms about From Russia With Love, the film, is that the plot itself is actually quite complicated and convoluted. and It, it, it takes a while to set up. Um, and even when it is set up, on a first viewing, you're kind of watching it going, okay, well, he knows that they know it's a plan, and they know that he knows they know it's a plan, but does she know that they know that he know? And it, it can be very uh, confusing. But in this game, they do a really good job of simplifying the setup, but not simplifying the plot itself, which I think is really commendable. Next up is an MI6 mission brief, which, weirdly, isn't a cutscene, but has you controlling Bond around the MI6 office. And I absolutely love this. It really makes the thing more engaging and less of an information dump, which it could easily have been. Plus, it's so much fun being able to walk up to Moneypenny and harass her. Oh, James. A good sound alike for Bernard Lee talks you through the plot. Bond needs to go to Istanbul to meet Tatiana Romanova, who's fallen in love with a picture of Bond, and will give him a lecture decoding machine so long as he brings her back to London with him. Once the brief is over, it's off to Q Branch for some training and fun in the lab. Again, I know Q wasn't named as such in From Russia With Love the film, but receiving gadget explanations from a Q that looks like Desmond Llewellyn while controlling Bond around a classic Q lab from the 60s is just awesome. If this were all just one big cutscene like the ones in Everything or Nothing, it could become dry and boring, but controlling Bond around these environments actually makes the information dumping quite engaging. Once that's done, it's off to Istanbul to meet Kerim Bey. James, my friend. How nice to see you. Kerim Bey. It's been too long. Who apparently knows Bond already? Your man Q sent it ahead. Warned me not to touch any of the buttons. You were wise to take his advice. Otherwise, you might not live to regret it. Uh, okay. 
Okay, when has Bond ever been respectful of Q's advice? A bit of a buzzkill there, James. Anyway, whatever, as to the Aston Martin is cool. This is the game's first driving level and presents a significant step down from the driving levels of previous games. This car, though gorgeous and beautiful, handles uh, appallingly. It's a chore to drive this bloody thing, and I can imagine that that's authentic. Obviously, cars 40, 50 years ago didn't handle as well as cars today, but it just doesn't make for a fun gaming experience. I shouldn't get too carried away, though. There's still a lot of fun to be had in this game's driving segments. I just wish the car had a few more usable gadgets. The only thing aside from machine guns and missiles is the tire slashing thing. Uh, oil slicks would have been appreciated. Even the ejector seat would have been fun when Karen Bay's explanation has gone a little bit too long. The driving bit soon leads into repelling and tank destroying before the game segues into the next level which finds Bond at Station T where an attack takes place which provides a good excuse for Bond to try out his new Q-copter gadget. This thing provides a similar function to the Q-spider from Everything or Nothing and it is largely used to get the drop on enemies and open very large doors. Several hostages and a really cool boss fight with a Spectre helicopter later, and it's back into the Aston for more driving shenanigans before Bond and Karim get to play dress up as soldiers. Oh yeah, that's another kind of cool feature about this game. You can actually pick and choose what clothes you want Bond to wear in most situations. It's a strange feature, and you wonder why the game makers thought gamers would give a crap about whether Connery was wearing his tux or his stealth gear, but I actually find it quite novel. If only they had a Roger Moore-style safari suit in this wardrobe, I think I'd be ten times happier. Next up is a really cool interpretation of the Sistan sequence from the film, this time featuring Bond using a Gatling gun to take out Russian soldiers along the way. Quite the place, isn't it, James? The Emperor Constantine built it as a reservoir 1,600 years ago. He drowned his enemies and ex-wives down here, too. Jeez, Bond, take it easy. God, is he on a real downer in this game, or is it just me between this and the cute branch comment earlier? I mean, cheer up, James. Why so serious? After lots of good shooting action, Bond and Karim do some spying on the Russian consulate and part ways so Bond can find some blueprints to the consulate and exit the systems in style with another jetpack. It's incredibly contrived how the jetpacks end up in rooms with Bond, but flying around in these things is just about the funnest thing in the whole game. The helicopter level from Everything or Nothing was great, but controlling a Sean Connery jetpack wearing Bond is just a whole other level of awesomeness. Complete and total geek gasm. Next up is the Gypsy Camp, which recreates the girl fight from the original film and allows Bond to at least have a smirk and display some trademark Bond flippancy. He's a lucky man, the Chief Son. <laughs> wow, okay, I can see some uh, character animator. Probably had a lot of fun uh, working on this scene. Just like in the film, shit kicks off and you have to run around rescuing gypsies, killing bad guys, etc. Uh, this is a really fun level and one of my favourites in the game. It's also one of the few sequences from the film that doesn't need to be amped up too much for the game. I still don't understand why they didn't just adapt a more action-friendly Sean Connery Bond film for this game, but you know what, oh well, so far so good, really. Speaking of scenes being amped up, the next level is probably the most ridiculously exaggerated from the film in the entire game, but before that we finally meet Tatiana, who is being briefed by Cleb, who seems to retain her lesbian traits from the movie version. But what am I to do with the English agent when I meet him? Whatever he asks. You may go. Did she just check out Tanya's ass? <laughs> The Sniper Alley level is one of my favourites in the entire game. I wish more levels entailed running around through dark, smoky Istanbul streets. Anyway, Bond acts as cover for Kerim, who is out to get Krolenko, who lives in the same Bob Hope movie promotion as in the film version. I quite like how this relatively minor detail from the film is intact here, but it does beg the question, has anyone in the world ever even seen Call Me Buana? 
Once Bond gets to the roof and you start protecting Karim from enemy soldiers, the level really comes to life. I love this whole sequence, and it's probably my favourite bit of the game. I'm not normally one for sniper-based levels, but there's something so easy and satisfying about using snipers in this game. It's, it's just an excellent level. Krilinko is killed, and it's off to recreate more scenes from the film, minus Connery's uh, hairier than Sasquatch chest, but retaining all the dirty talk with Tanya. Thank you, but I think my mouth is too big. No, it's the right size. For me, that is. It's a blowjob joke, kids! Is that the correct time? Ration clocks are always... <laughs> The next level has Bond running around the Russian consulate trying to attain the Lecter device. Oh yes, something I've not talked about yet. There's a new weapon in this game called a serum gun, and when you shoot enemies with it, it turns them against each other. It's an interesting idea, but not one that gels with the game's whole classic feel, really, but you know, it's fun nonetheless. After running around and going up and down in lifts, Bond and Tanya eventually find and take the Lecter. Throughout this level, you have to protect Tanya as some enemies will attack attack her, increasing her... threat... meter? Really? Threat meter? We had to call it that? I mean, why not just call it a health meter? It serves exactly the same purpose as a health meter. Threat meter just... Okay, I know this is being nitpicky, but... Threat meter? After escaping with the Lecter, it's another driving level around Foggy Assemble as Bond and Tanya race to the station before the Orient Express leaves. For some reason, it's not quite good enough to just go to the station, though, and you have to take out a specific number of bad guys before you're allowed to go. I don't have a huge issue with this at all, but I do find it slightly annoying that on this level you can't really see where enemies are, so they tell you have to eliminate so many enemies and then you're just driving around waiting for bad guys to pop up so that you actually have something to do. Bond, Tanya and Kerim get to the train and we have a lengthy, highly expositional cutscene which tries to hit all the plot and character beats of the film version, but I, I, it, it just can't do it in such a, a short space of time. I feel kind of bad complaining about this because obviously this is a game, it's not a film, but when they try to replicate uh, the dramatic, cinematic moments uh, from the film, it just can't do it, it can't compete. Kerim is oft here with little to no care, and we don't even see Bond react to the death of his friend here. I mean, we have the red wine with fish thing too, but it's glazed over, and to be honest, Bond just comes across as looking like a bit of an idiot here. In the film, we knew Bond was suspicious of this man, but had no real reason to doubt him. Here, he doesn't question the guy at all, despite the constant scowling and glances of contempt, and is actually quite perky when he sits down. Down for food with the guy. So tell me about the escape plan. The plan, old man, is that you die on the train. I should have known. Red wine with fish. <laughs> the legendary fight with Grant in the train carriage from the film is uh, semi replicated here in the dining cart, but you don't actually control Bond fighting Grant, which is such a missed opportunity. Would it really have been so hard just to say, like, you know, press B here, press X here, or uh, just. It's something, anything. Like, one of the best fight sequences in all of Bond. How could they not let the user control Bond during that fight sequence? Instead, you spend a while fighting some goons while Grant and his own henchwoman, Ava Adara? Uh, could have done with a bit more of an introduction to her, maybe? Anyway, they run off with the Lecter while Bond gives chase, facing off an armoured train and eventually Grant in a boss fight which is actually quite good, even if Kerim's death is very much glazed over here. A great James Bond. I've killed your friend Kerim Bay. You're next. Okay, we're just gonna keep on playing? Right? Not gonna uh, give that mention a second thought? Nope. No grieving? Nope. Okay, well, let's just carry on shooting then. It's not as if Kerim was a warm, lovable, likeable character that we came to really appreciate, even in this video game version. Never mind. <laughs> Oh. 
Brent is run over by a train. Uh, Tanya is left with one of Kerim's sons while Bond drives off into the next level, Factory, which has Bond arrive at some spe- Oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot we're in the legally ambiguous years here. Sorry. Uh, Bond arrives at some octopus factory and sets about destroying the place. It's one of the most fun and action-packed levels in the game, but there's a jetpack in it, so of course it's wonderful. The level also debuts Bond's snow gear. Lovely, sexy snow gear. Though no match for a good old-fashioned safari suit, of course. By the way, I love this room when you get to the bowels of the factory. It's such a wonderful Ken Adam-inspired design, and oh my goodness, I, 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 I adore the version of the, the James Bond theme they play during this section. successfully blows the place up and secures the Lecter after disabling Eva. The penultimate level of the game sees Bond reunited with Tanya and the Aston Martin queuing yet another fun, action-packed driving level, which segues nicely into a recreation of the boat chase from the film, adding significantly more action into the mix, of course. So that's pretty much the end of the game, but there is still one level left, which is really intriguing. Like, have they made an entire level out of Bond's confrontation with Cleb? I, I, I'm really interested to see what happens in this next sequence. 24 hours ago, we received a message from Octopus. They've stolen a nuclear weapon and are threatening to blow up London unless we pay them a hundred billion pounds. And you've tracked the weapon to here? We believe it's the Octopus secret base. Quite! A lot of artistic license taken with this one, but you know what? I'm willing to roll with it because it is an incredible setup. Yeah, we have a cutscene recreating one of the last parts of the movie with Bond killing Cleb, and then it's a abrupt fade, and then all of a sudden Octopus have a nuke that they're going to fire at London unless they get some money. It all turns very Thunderball here, doesn't it? Anyway, it's a really bad segue, but the level itself is totally and completely awesome. One of my absolute favourites in the whole game. I do think that From Russia With Love hits the perfect balance of number of levels and duration of levels. I've complained about previous games having too many levels that last 30 seconds and others well, Rogue Agent, anyway, having too few levels, but they all seem to last, like, over an hour. The balance in From Rush With Love, though, is perfect. I don't think any level overstays its welcome or frustrates me with shortness. It's all just perfectly judged. Anyway, this uh, final level is a perfect balance of so many aspects of the game. Lots of shooting, stunning level design, jetpack segments, grand scale... It's wonderful, and I love how Octopus took the effort to emboss their logo on the stolen nuke before firing it. Eva Adara pops up one last time to have a shot at Bond and serves as a, a mini-boss at the level's halfway mark before she foolishly hits full throttle and blows herself up in this, like, tiny hangar. It was a kind of wasted opportunity of a henchwoman, wasn't she? It might have been interesting to throw some new characters into this classic setting, but she's oft with as much thought as she was introduced. Which is to say, not much. After disarming the nuke, Bond calls M on his massive mobile phone. Wait a minute, wasn't he talking to M earlier without such a device? Anyway, Red Grant emerges again in some kind of multi-appendaged mechanical contraption to serve as the game's final boss. Until this most recent playthrough, I'd completely forgotten that Red Grant reappears at the end of this film as, like, the big end-of-game boss, and I so love that he does. It's really great seeing him come back here. Uh, though I am quite disappointed we get no uh, glimpse of an octopus number one in this game. This final boss fight is really cool, and I love that Red Grant actually came back for this. It means that you kind of get two big boss fights with Red Grant in one game. This one in particular, though, is just the right level of difficulty to feel satisfying once Grant is finally defeated. The 
You're gonna shoot me in cold blood, old man. You don't have the guts. It's not the English way. It's like red wine with fish. That was for Kerry. Oh, that's so awesome. Okay, fi fi fine. You know what? This makes up for the lack of empathy Bond showed when he found out about Kerim's death earlier. And killing Grant in cold blood is a nice little uh, reference to uh, killing Professor Dent in Doctor No. I like it. And so that's the end of the main story. So how does the game fare with its non-campaign features? Well, there are plenty of unlockables to keep you busy here. There are weapon and gadget upgrades to buy, multiplayer characters to unlock, art packs to view, level trailers to watch. Wait, what level trailers? Why the hell would I want to watch a trailer for a level when I could just play it? Curious inclusion. Anyway, uh, some of the more exciting unlockables are for bonus levels. None of these are particularly excellent, but I guess they're good for completists. I generally find them quite dull. They have nothing to do with the main story and only really ask you to perform very basic tasks like kill everyone in the airport or defuse the bombs in the time limit. If only there was a bonus driving level, now that would be something worth unlocking. And finally, there's a multiplayer feature, which is pretty awesome, to be honest. I never play this half as much as Agent Under Fire or Nightfire or GoldenEye Reloaded multiplayer, but it's actually one of the more unique and interesting Bond multiplayers out there, largely thanks to the variety of play offered by vehicles, jetpacks, and environment tools. My favourite in particular being the Missile Silo map, when you pick up certain items, you can launch these nukes, which obliterate everyone who has rushed into a locked down area. It used to be so much fun playing this with friends and watching everyone kind of drop what they were doing and run for cover when the countdown started. Overall, it's a really solid multiplayer feature, lots of fun. It's a shame everything or nothing didn't have a similar feature, but whatever, the multiplayer here is a lot better than you'd expect it to be, really. So there we go, that's from Russia With Love, the video game, and you know what? It's a really great James Bond game. If you liked Everything or Nothing, chances are you'll like this game too. They're very much in the same vein, and I would say around about on par in most aspects. My main surprise of playing through this game this time was that, well, in my mind, I always remembered infinitely preferring this to Everything or Nothing, but now, playing them in such quick succession, I'd say they really are equal in terms of quality. There's no doubt that From Russia With Love feels more rushed than everything or nothing, which felt like it had a lot of time and dedication given to it. From Russia With Love was, so I hear, developed quite quickly after a sequel to everything or nothing titled Phoenix Fire was scrapped after Brosnan was dropped as Bond. I'm sad to live in a world where I'll never get to play Phoenix Fire, as it sounds like it could have been a really cool way of building on EA's own Brosnan Bond universe, but From Russia With Love is a pretty good consolation prize. Of course, one of the main draws of this game is that it has Connery playing James Bond again. It is, of course, incredible to have Sean Connery lending his voice to new dialogue for James Bond, but I'd be lying if I said it was a seamless process. Old man Connery voice coming out of young Connery look is jarring, but I don't know if there's any better solution to this. It'd be pretty crap if they used a sound alike and equally as crap if they just like reused audio from the film. So I guess in that case, old man Connery was probably the best way to go. I, oh God, I sound so ungrateful and I don't mean to, but it's just... Ah, uh, you know what, how can anyone not love Sean Connery coming back and recording new scenes, dialogue as James Bond? It, 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 it is pretty incredible. None of the rest of the cast come back, as most of them were, well, dead at this point, but the sound-alikes are really quite excellent, especially the guy doing Karen Bay. The game itself is really just almost exactly the same as Everything or Nothing, taking away some aspects, adding some more, but the basic elements are more or less the same. I do hate the weapon-switching interface and how it pauses the game instead of letting you continue playing while scrolling through
through your weapons. And there is a special circle of hell reserved for whoever invented this special ammo nonsense. It's so frustrating to have to go to the menu to switch between regular ammo and special ammo. Why not make it an easier interface? The driving levels are also a step down from everything or nothing. I've already mentioned how difficult it is, or at least how difficult I find it controlling the cars in this game, and yeah, I'm sure it's more realistic that way, but it just doesn't have the same level of fun. I do, however, think the majority of the level design is incredible. It really does feel like a Bond universe. The villains' lairs are perfectly decorated for the era this is set, and being able to control Bond around the MI6 office and the classic Q branch is really neat. I love how the From Russia With Love game universe is really an amalgamation of, I would say, the first five Connery Bond films. You know, we have the jetpack in there, we have the Aston, we have, uh, you know, a Q branch. But it does kind of beg the question, then, why bother basing the game on From Russia With Love if you're gonna take so much from all of the other Connery Bond films? If I had to talk about the main weakness of this game, I think it, it kind of like it, the game feels shackled to its cinematic namesake. The best levels in this game are the ones that stray farthest away from the film. The opening level at Parliament, the driving segments, the last level, the factory. It's when it gets bogged down into recreating bits of dialogue from the film that it sort of falls apart because it just comes across as so watered down. The sequence on the train, for example, just doesn't have the oomph that it did in the film. So, how could this have been solved? Well, in my opinion, simple. You keep Sean Connery as James Bond, you keep it set in the 60s, you keep all the elements of Sean Connery's Bond, so the Aston, all the MI6 regulars, the jetpack, etc., but create an original story. How awesome would that have been? I mean, if this game had an original story, it could have been a new Bond adventure starring Sean Connery as Bond. Heck, they could have just taken the Phoenix by a story, changed some elements, the time period and references to Nightfire, and given it to Connery. I can't get over just how much of a missed opportunity this was. This could have been the seventh original Connery Bond adventure. Yes, I said seventh, I don't count, never say never again, but it's not all bad because what we did get here is a very fun game and a nice apology to us fans for having to put up with GoldenEye Rogue Agent. While it would have been great to have this be an original story, at the time I did like the direction EA were taking the games. Me and my friends would talk about how awesome it'd be if they did the next one with Roger Moore, a game dedicated to The Spy Who Loved Me or Moonraker would have been awesome. I, I do think EA did a largely great job with the Bond games when they had the license, and I would have loved to see them continue making Bond games until, well, until now. But sadly, this was not meant to be, and Activision bought the license, prompting something of a hiatus in the Bond game series until it finally returned with somewhat mixed results on an entirely new generation of consoles with the Quantum of Solace video game. 